My grandfather was a New York State forest ranger based in Long Lake. And I remember the topographic maps he had tacked up on a wall in his office. A half dozen quads were aligned edge to edge in a continuous sheet, and push pins marked the locations of fire towers. Each pin had a string attached, and when a fire was called in, the string could be pulled out along the compass bearing reported by the observer. With reports from multiple towers, the strings would cross at the location of the fire. Those maps on my grandfather's wall hearkened back to an earlier time, and by the 1970s, the forest fire risk had lessened, and the use of aircraft had mostly replaced observers stationed in towers. But my interest in maps was kindled, and I have USGS topographic maps collected from all the places where I have lived, Alaska, Colorado, and of course the Adirondacks. By the 1980s, the best Adirondack maps for hikers came with the guidebooks published by the Adirondack Mountain Club. And these days, hikers rely on maps from the National Geographic Society, published under the Trails Illustrated banner. I still appreciate paper maps, and sometimes I pull them out just to look at them, but I rarely carry a map on outings now. The maps and GPS on my phone are more useful And as long as you keep an eye on the battery and don't take a swim with your phone in your pocket, reliable. But maps can also be used to tell a story. And the history of the Adirondacks can be read in the maps such as the Sergeant Commission map of 1891, the first map to show an outline of the Forest Preserve. And then there was the 1916 Fire Protection map. I'll return to that one in a minute. In her book, The Great Forest of the Adirondacks, Barbara McMartin describes how she searched for old growth by identifying forest plots acquired by the state before 1900. She also correlated land ownership and logging records with simple practicalities, such as the distance to waterways that might be used to float logs to a mill. Working in the late 1990s, McMartin noted that despite all she had found, the map record was incomplete and ultimately would have to be computerized. Which brings us to today. Many interesting Adirondack base maps are available as high-resolution images, and a variety of information can be overlaid to gain new insights. This video is the first in a series where I will look at these maps to see what they can tell us about the past and maybe about the future. Over the past century, many of the policies put in place to manage the forest preserve have come, at least in part, as a response to the immense forest fires that burned between 1895 and 1920. And we can read part of that story in the previously mentioned fire protection map. That map shows areas of green timber, burned over areas, and also areas that might be prone to fire. Those areas were labeled as logged for softwood only, considerable slash, or logged for soft and hardwood, much slash. The poor logging practices of that era left an open canopy and piles of tinder dry slash, an ideal combination for out of control wildfires. Equally important was the role this map played in supporting the capacity to extinguish fires. The map shows where rangers were stationed, where a telephone could be found, and where firefighting equipment had been cached. In 1916, neither telephones nor paved roads were in everyday use in the Adirondacks. Forest managers had also learned that spotting fires early on was critical and several dozen fire observation towers were built between 1910 and 1920. And those towers served a second purpose. Right from the start, the views made possible by the towers attracted hikers, and the observers recorded how many visitors they had alongside the number of fires they had spotted. Many of the towers were visited by hundreds of people each year, 
and the observers took on the job of educating the public about the forests they helped to protect. Some two dozen of those towers still stand, and they are still visited by hikers who enjoy the views. At the turn of the 20th century, the conservation of natural resources as a public ideal was a new idea, and New York State was leading the way. But it was the pressing need to protect property, both public and private, that helped to build support for the forest preserve. Stakeholders with widely varied interests cooperating in support of a larger public good. A lesson from the past worth our consideration today. Okay.